Hello. <laughs> oh, that was my Jerry Lewis opening. Hello, lady. No, really. Hello, my name is Eric Bergen, and welcome to Green Room Radio. This is our second DVD show, and we couldn't be more excited today than to feature a great interview with Will McRobb. And now, Will, if you for, for those of you who don't know, uh, Will was one of the creators of The Adventures of Pete and Pete. Do you guys remember that show? Okay, that this was my favorite show back in the day when it was on Nickelodeon, you know, like 91, 92, 93. It was such a great show about two brothers. Um, it was one of my favorites along with, you know, Doug and Rugrats and Clarissa Explains It All and all of those early Nickelodeon shows. And Pete and Pete Season 1 is finally being released on DVD. Oh, boy. I have hours of pleasure. <laughs> is it sad that that's what I do? Anyway, we have a great interview with Will McRobb, again, who is one of the creators of the show. And uh, let's get started here on Green Room Radio. It's not a strange You look at half a leader And I'll give you a shell of shame, And now on the line, we have one of the original creators of The Adventures of Pete and Pete, Will McRobb. How are you, Will? I'm doing great. So this is, well, congratulations, first of all, on the release of uh, the DVD of Season 1 of Pete and Pete. Thank you very much. Uh, well, I, ten years in the making. Yeah. I have I to we, say, we, we, I was... Uh, I was just going to say, we did, we did the last uh, the last show. It was about ten years ago. Was it really? God. Yeah, that's right. It seems so. Wow. Now, I have <laughs> to say, I grew up on this show, and I always thought it was the coolest, you know, oddest, weirdest thing on Nickelodeon at the time. How did the show get started? Well, um, Chris Viscardi and I, Chris is the uh, co-creator uh, of the show. We were... Um, just uh, a couple of like lunch bucket promo guys over at Nickelodeon. We we were it's our first job out of school, and you know we were churning out uh, commercials for the what was on Nickelodeon at the, at the time, and um, you know shows like um, I don't know uh, Dennis the Menace, I guess things like that. And um, there was opportunities there to, at one point to do some uh, narrative pieces that would still be considered promos, um, but would kind of be there just to promote the attitude of Nickelodeon, and so. Um, we came up with Pete and Pete uh, as a 60-second commercial, really, just a commercial that kind of conveyed the attitude of the, of the network. It had nothing to do with the shows, but it conveyed the, the Nick attitude. So um, we got this rare opportunity, being promo guys, to do something narrative, and that's where Pete and Pete got its start. We did these uh, mini epics that um, some of them, I think, are on the DVD. We ended up doing about 20 of those. And uh, gradually, they kind of... Uh, became popular, and uh, people started thinking, well, maybe we should do a half-hour version of this, which we did, uh, starting off with this Valentine's Day special, uh, which was in, uh, debuted in uh, Valentine's Day 1991, and, um, and we did four more specials after that, and then starting in 1993, we began uh, the first of three seasons of the show proper, and we ultimately ended up doing 39 shows, and... Uh, you're getting the first 13 on, on this DVD, and, and I, I hear the remaining 26 will be coming out in uh, in the months to come. Now, I remember the early days of Nickelodeon. There was something very odd about it. There was something very offbeat. It was, you know, the early days of what would you do and... Uh, yeah, what was Double Dare and stuff. Double Dare, right, right, right. And there was that Nick Arcade, and it was very funky, new wave. I, I, I mean, I remember loving it. What was... Could describe what was the environment like there. Well, it was, it was um, it, now Nickelodeon is, you know, it's been around for a long time and it's become this real sort of uh, corporate corporate juggernaut. You know, it's, uh, you know, it's part of MTV networks and it's become a real, you know, household name and, uh, you know, it uh, is very much consumed with uh, doing big projects and making big 
but you know, having big budgets, just much bigger right. enterprise. But back back then, it had only been around for about uh, a couple, you know, maybe ten years or so, and it was still trying to find itself, and um, was not quite as commercially, um, I guess, uh, so concerned with things commercial at the time. So um, there was a fair amount of time to do to be creative, and uh, you know, uh, most places when you work in the promo department. You know, it's a, a pretty thankless job. You know, just churning out uh, spots, t telling you when to watch a, sh a certain show. But then, uh, with um, you know, uh, there was there wasn't as much original programming. A lot of it was purchased material, like Lassie and things like that. So, um, in order to put a stamp on this on this network, they invested a lot of money and a lot of time into doing stuff in between the shows. And so, if you worked in the promo department, then you got to do cool stuff. Uh, Invariably, you know, uh, whatever you wanted to do, you could find a way to turn it into something 30 seconds long or 60 seconds long. And P P was sort of a product of that really fertile time where, uh, you know, if it uh, in any way, shape, or form could be construed as as promoting a, you know, this kind of kid, you know, kids rule kind of mentality, you could probably get it on the air. So it was like a real lab in a way for doing stuff that uh, really come, came from your heart. And uh, you know, I'm not I'm not sure it's that is that. That is the, the general vibe over there anymore. But then it was kind of like um, anything goes kind of feeling. A lot of people have said that the Adventures of Pete and Pete were ahead of its time, was ahead of its time, and and that not a lot of people really got the show. Uh, many uh, there, I read a quote that if you if you were always a kid at heart or something like that, you you got the show. But if you grow up too fast, you blew it off as something stupid. What? What in your mind? <laughs> I hear you laughing. Is that not? Uh, <laughs> well, that, we, it, it, what, what were you going to say? You're, you, what, what in my mind was? Um, well, what in your mind when when creating the show, or when, when I'm sorry, when coming up with that the 30 second spot? What was it besides the attitude of Nickelodeon? What it was? What what was it about the two guys that? How did that come to be? Well, the the big idea behind Pete and Pete, uh, there's a couple of things that we we wanted to get across. I mean, for starters, we couldn't believe we had a chance to do something narrative. So we, the the reason the 60 second spots and the shows themselves were, were later were so incredibly dense was because we just never thought we were going to get a chance to do another one. So we wanted to put every idea we ever had into every single one of them. But also, too, we really wanted to tell stories the way kids tell stories, and you know how kids tell stories is just like stream of consciousness, one fact after the other, you know, the emphasis seems to be in the wrong place, and, and, and ultimately the kid's just deadly serious about it. There's like a real kind of great way in which kids tell stories. I, I guess it's just sort of unselfconscious and just driven by its own eternal logic and has a certain sweetness, but, you know, also with kids, you know, we really recognize that there's a lot of sadness and there's also just a lot of absurdity. And so, you know, we wanted to pack all that in and, and have that really kind of, I guess we're really trying to get at you know what the way a kid tells a story, and also the way a kid sees the world, and uh, and that's where Pete and Pete kind of got it started. And along with that, I, I'd also add that um, we uh, we wanted to we kind of feel like Chris and I always felt like things today with kids are kind of over-explained. You know, every every there's very little mystery left for kids to kind of sink their teeth into. I mean, it's it's in books for sure, but it's it's not really in life as much. There's just too much media, and there's just too many ways to figure out how everything works, and and what's left is just like you know everything has uh, been picked apart. So we just thought, hey, let's let's do a show where kids have the same first name, and and we never explain why, and and let's have a superhero who may or may not have powers, and let's give mom a metal plate which can pick up baseball games from you know other cities, <laughs> and let's just like not explain it, and uh, let's just add some more mystery back into the world. And uh, I think that was other, the other big thing driving the show, just more mystery. And uh, I think yeah, on that level, it really succeeded. That was the great part about the show was that it, it it that's why kids got it is why the the show thought like a kid and then and, and um it didn't try to teach you a lesson it sort of you know you enjoyed the lesson with it uh tell me how uh the two peets came where did you find them and how that was what the casting process was like yeah sure well we um we did our did our casting, and um, you know, I guess we started doing it in 1989. So uh, we started casting it. Must have been the summer of 1989, and you know, just saw a zillion kids, and we weren't quite sure what we were looking for. I mean, the um, the other big thing driving Pete and Pete, along with the mystery idea, and um, you know, wanting to tell stories a kid, the, the kid way, is we wanted to tell a story. Of, uh, we wanted to do a show about two brothers who were best friends, and, uh, and you know, have them be separated by at least five years, 
and really get into that. You know, most TV treats uh, siblings as rivals, or you know, there's there's a lot of animosity between brothers in a typical kid sitcom. But uh, we thought let's make them best friends and, and see where that can go, and have them create their own little world. So we were looking for a certain kind of chemistry, and when we uh, met Michael Morona and uh, Danny Tamarelli, um, you know, it was just pure coincidence that they both had red hair, but it certainly didn't hurt. And um, and we put them in a room together, and they just, you know, they were really, right from the start, they clicked, they liked each other, and that fondness, I think, is something, is something you can fake, and we really kind of work with uh, the kind of uh, bond they had with each other over all, the, over all the shows we made over the years. Taking the show from promo spots to a real full-out series, how was it trying to find new stories to tell and, and each week, and, and what was the production of the actual series like? Right, right. Well, it was, um, you know, we, were, we often talk about whether the show c- could have gotten made uh, in any form if it hadn't existed already as the 60s, because it was like, um, you know, it was kind of like the Simpsons kind of got their start that way, not to compare us with the Simpsons in any, in any way, other than <laughs> how we kind of started small and eventually got bigger. But um, it did help, you know. It, it, I don't think Pete and Pete would have ever come to life if it had been pitched as a half-hour show. There's just too many things about it that would have been watered down. Um, and a lot of our experience in make, trying to make shows in the aftermath of Pete and Pete has, has proven us, proven again and again that things do tend to get watered down um, if they're perceived as being too strange or, or too original. But Pete and Pete already ex- it existed for a year and a half in, in the form of the 60s, and, and people have become um, you know, uh, invested enough in the whole Pete and Pete world that uh, they were willing to take a chance with the, with the half hours. But even so, they were incredibly cautious about it. I mean, if you think about how long it took to get the series on the air, we were making the, the 60 second spots in 1989, and they didn't really get together. Nickelodeon didn't really find the courage to put it on the air as a series until 1993. So it was four years, which I guess you could say was Nickelodeon having cold feet, but at the same time, we benefited because it allowed us to kind of like, uh, almost like having a, uh, a farm team for the show. We were able to make mistakes and able to like bit by bit kind of put it together. So by the time we were, we were in a position to, to do a whole bunch of shows, we knew exactly what we wanted to do. And if you look at the shows, and if you get this DVD, there's the first five specials. Well, actually, there's only four of the five. One of them isn't on there, but uh, four of the five specials are on there. And you can really see how the show changed because uh, the first – two shows, the Valentine's Day one and the uh, Summer Vacation one, you could still see how the writing of it was still in the mentality of doing these 60-second spots. They're, they're, they're very dense, and there's lots of t- narration, and uh, the stories are um, super-packed, almost to a, an annoying degree, I would say. But then as we kind of learned <laughs> that you don't have to just pack you know, two hours of material into a half hour, and you can open it up and tell the stories with a little bit more... Um, leisure and just, you know, have the stories kind of breathe a bit, you, you'll see as the, as the show moves along into the, the later specials and into the series that uh, not as dense and not as much narration, and uh, I think the stories are ended up being a lot better. So uh, it, uh, it, you know, and then, you know, it's going, going on to two and seasons two and three, different things happen, but I think by the time we were halfway through the first season, we found a way to keep things as strange and as funny and as sad as, as they'd ever been, but not feel like we had uh, to put uh, every last idea we ever had into every episode. You spoke of The Simpsons. Was The Simpsons an inspiration to you as far as the writing, or were there any other shows that were an inspiration to the no, Not really. People? Not really. I mean, we, um, in terms of other shows, we're big fans of, of TV, and um, I'm sure lots of that trickled down into the show. I think what really influenced Pete and Pete more than anything was... Uh, Indie rock music. Uh, I mean, the show is is filled with you know great, great bands like the Magnetic Fields and and um, and the great theme song, and the great theme song by uh, Polaris and uh, and I think a lot of a lot of the ideas we had, a lot of the emotion we wanted to get into the show um, came from liking that kind of music. I mean, we used to look at the sixty second spots as being like singles, and like a great single, we wanted it to be just kind of funny and weird and great and catchy and maybe not make complete sense, but have it stick in your mind. And then I think we looked at the half hours as more like albums, you know, still lots of great cuts on each album. And I, I think um, uh, more than TV, I, I would say, you know, bands like, you know, Pavement or uh, Miracle Legion or uh, Super Chunk or um, 
the replacements or any bands that, uh, that uh, kind of capture the, the rawness, you know, but also the kind of like uh, emotion of um, of life. Those are those are the things that kept the show really, I think, sparkling. The show, I don't want to say cult following, but it gained a a small but dedicated following over the years. 